All right, this little lecture, we're just going to do a couple examples of those confidence intervals and real engineering practices. So this one should go pretty quick. So if you haven't seen lectures 4B, I highly suggest you look at that one first. 4C will actually do a couple examples on how this actually looks um, when you actually do them for real. So let's go again and get started. So this is examples of the confidence intervals we stuff we've already talked earlier about. So this first one, we're going to pull a sample of 64 hydraulic brakes and find that the wear after 500 miles is 30 micrometers. The standard deviation for the sample is 50 micrometers. What's a 95 for Kent confidence interval on that means? So in other words is, how big do I need to put a confidence interval around that 300 micrometers uh, so that I have a pretty good idea that 95% of the ways that I could have pulled these 64 hydraulic brakes um, would actually contain the true wear average for all hydraulic brakes in my population. So I'm going to pull some of the numbers out of there. I've got 64. That's the size of the sample. I've got what average I measured. So this is the measured average of the sample. Then I've got the standard deviation for the sample. So this is all based on data. This is my risk level, my confidence interval percentage, or this is my risk tolerance. And I need to be able to use that to find Z values. I've got an N greater than 30, so I'm gonna go ahead and use Z values as opposed to T values. And we'll talk about what, what those are, what the difference is on a different problem. So I got my data and I got my risk factors. Now I put them all together. There's my confidence interval equation I have. So I calculate my standard error. It's S divided by the square root of N. I get 6.25. I look this up, look up on a Z table. We'll see Y and all that stuff later, where I can actually calculate out of a calculator. But it gives me some multiplication factor that I need to use. So my this is my TIE fighter wings that I had before, my confidence interval wings width. And here's my actual interval that I have. What this means is, if I were to say based on this sample, that the actual population population average was in that range, I'd be correct 95% of the time if I sampled randomly and good. And we'll talk more about what that really means in a different lecture. So um, if I really thought the population range was in there, you know, obviously, this the actual data I'm going to collect is going to shift it. And my risk factor, I could actually increase this up. My confidence interval is the more the wider I want it to be. This is going to go up. And the more screwed up my data is, the higher the variance is, higher the st uh, standard deviation is, this is going to rise. As well as if the number of samples I collect goes up, that'll bring it back down again. So the more data I collect, I can get rid of my ignorance or I can change my risk. And those are my two possibilities. So that's one example. Another example, I'm doing the space shuttle booster rocket hauls. I'm pulling them out. I don't have a whole lot of them. I only have nine. Um, I'm getting the averages at the corrosion levels of 45 meters squared. I got a sample standard deviation of 12. What's the 99% confidence interval? So again, I extract all the data. Same data I had before. I have less than 30 and I also don't know or assume I know a population variance. So I don't know that. So I'm going to have to use a T value instead. So I'll use a T tables to get my scores. I'll talk a little bit about this in some other class. This is a degree of freedom. So in this case, how many data, data numbers did I have? I picked nine. I'm going to have to look as these tables require I know how much data I actually collected. And it just has to deal with very low sample sizes that do this. And so I got the same idea. I calculated, I calculate my standard error again. I grab my T from this comes from a table. Then I do the same thing I did before. I'd multiply my risk by my ignorance to get a range, which is also known as my confidence interval. So I have this one peg here, it's at 45. I've got TIE fighter wings like the other lecture. They go from 31 to 56 to 58 to 44. 
right? This is this here is the width, right? This width is always that T or it's that Z times standard error, depending on which one you're going to use. That's the plus side. This is the minus side. Z and standard error, or T and standard error. Some scores. And so if I said this time, if based on that sample, the mu was in that range, I would I've 90, on 99% of all the possible samples I could get if I did this cleanly, the actual true population would be inside that range, right? And so if I think if I think it's outside that, either I picked a really bad sample, or I am it really isn't. Right? That's the two options, and we'll talk more about that when we get to the other lecture about actual hypothesis testing about whether or not that really is in there or not. But this is really just to kind of how you calculate confidence intervals given actual numbers and data that you're actually collecting. So taking the theory that we did in the other lecture in 4B, moving it into actual more calculation in this 4C. All right, and we'll see you next time.